Okay, so the equivalence of matrix norms basically says that uh, if you have two different norms, you can bound the norm of any matrix with respect to the first norm in terms of the norm of the matrix with respect to the second norm. And uh, this is useful again because you may be interested in showing convergence of certain algorithms. And in these algorithms, you'll get a sequence of matrices. And uh, once again, you we've seen that if you are able to show that the sequence of norms of these matrices, if that converges, then the matrix itself will converge. And so we are often interested in showing that the sequence of norms of a matrix converges, but then uh, for different problems, it may be more you, more uh, more easy to take different types of norms and show that that particular norm converges. But that may not be the norm in which you are actually executing this uh, optimization problem that you are interested in. Fortunately for us, these norms are all equivalent. So if uh, one particular norm is converging, then every norm will converge. Maybe not to the same value, but to some other value. And so it is uh, useful to have this kind of result on equivalence of matrix norms because it means we can use any norm that's convenient for us in trying to show convergence properties. So, so basically given any two norms, two matrix norms, alpha and then there exists a least positive constant cm of alpha beta such that the alpha norm of A is less than or equal to CM of alpha beta times the beta norm of A for every A. In fact, CM of alpha beta can be computed by solving CM of alpha beta is equal to the maximum over all A not equal to zero of norm A alpha divided by norm a beta so you take this ratio and you find the biggest number it can take then of course it must be true that norm a alpha is less than or equal to cm of alpha beta times norm a beta for any other a because that's like a suboptimal a that you're choosing which must satisfy this inequality <clears throat> so by if i in this you know i just said alpha and beta and uh, there's no, uh, I can always just exchange alpha and beta. And the, the way to say that is that there exists um, this, this CM of alpha beta, there exists similarly a CM of beta alpha, such that a beta is less than or equal to CM of beta alpha times a alpha and uh, this cm of beta alpha is computed as the maximum of norm a beta divided by norm a alpha so that's a different completely unrelated sort of different optimization problem so uh, it's not uh, I mean, so basically in general there is no relationship between CM of alpha beta and CM of beta alpha. 
but for induced norms that is both alpha norm and beta norm must be an induced norm they are equal so this is actually theorem 5.6.18 now the textbook has you know a lot a lot a lot of theorems i obviously cannot cover all of them but uh, where uh, where appropriate i'll indicate some theorems uh, mainly i'll focus on stating and proving theorems that we'll actually try and use later in the course uh, but this is just an interesting result that is there in in the text that you can go take a look if you're interested okay now there's just uh, two more definitions the first is the notion of a unitarily invariant norm so we say that this norm is unitarily invariant i'll write this in short here this is the same as this statement here if norm of a equals norm of u a v for every a belonging to c to the n cross n and c to the n cross n so one example is the spectral norm okay is unitarily okay this is a small exercise show this start from the definition and you will be able to show that the norm of uh, uav spectral norm is equal to the spectral norm of a for any a and all possible unitary matrices the second definition is <clears throat> is that so suppose is a matrix norm on c to the n cross n then so this is a new function i'm defining with an h on top which is defined to be the norm of a hermitian is also a matrix norm okay now this norm that i am defining here need not be an induced norm it's true for any norm any matrix norm that i can define on c to the n uh, if i instead of computing the norm of a if i say the norm of a is this uh, whatever norm i have defined operated on a hermitian that is also a matrix norm it's actually straightforward to show this from the definition so in particular if you take the frobenius norm this is the square root of the sum of the squares of all entries in the matrix a uh, this is equal to by definition the a hermitian frobenius norm so this is the hermitian or the h norm of the frobenius norm which is the frobenius norm of a hermitian of course a conjugate transpose doesn't change the sum of the squares of all of the magnitudes of all the entries in a so this is exactly equal to a2 and similarly we we defined this with two bars a1 uh, to be the sum of the magnitudes of all the entries of a so similarly if i define this h norm to be the 
one norm of a Hermitian, then again, taking the conjugate transpose doesn't change the magnitudes of the entries in A. So this is also equal to A1. So this is what we call the L1 norm. And uh, the spectral norm So if I take the H of the spectral norm, I'll work with the square because that's easier. This is equal to, I have to compute, so when I take the H norm, I have to compute the spectral norm of A Hermitian instead of the spectral norm of A. And then I have to square it. Now the spectral norm of A, uh, the spectral norm of a matrix is the square root of the largest eigenvalue of A Hermitian A. And so if I apply that to this, to A Hermitian, I get that this is equal to, the, the square of this is going to be rho of the spectral radius of A, A Hermitian. And this is another result that you have to show in your homework, that rho of A, A Hermitian is the same as rho of A Hermitian A, which is equal to the spectral norm of A square. Okay, so I'm slipping in two different things here. One is that I'm showing that the spectral norm of A is invariant to, to doing this H operation. The H norm of the spectral norm is the spectral norm itself. And the second thing is I'm saying that the spectral radius is has a nice relationship with the spectral norm in that the spectral norm squared, norm A2 squared, the spectral norm squared is exactly equal to the spectral radius of A Hermitian A. Okay, so that's the relationship between the spectral radius and the spectral norm. Uh, that's A relation between the spectral radius and the spectral norm. Okay, so this is homework. So you see that here, when I take this H norm, it gives you the same norm. Here also, when I took the H norm, it gives, gives me the same Frobenius norm. And the H norm of the L1 norm is also equal to the L1 norm. Such norms um, for which um, H is the same as the norm itself are called self-adjoint norms. Okay, and by the way, note that if I compute the max column sum norm, A H, that is equal to the max column sum norm of H A Hermitian, which by definition is the max row sum norm of A. And that is different from a L1, the max column sum norm of A. So this is not a self-adjoint norm. So max column sum norm and max row sum norm are not self adjunct okay so there's one very nice result that says that one the spectral norm is the only matrix norm that is both induced and unitarily invariant.
The second property is that the spectral norm is the only norm that is both induced and self-adjoint. Okay, the proof of this is in the text, um, but uh, these are again two um, special properties of the spectral norm, which is one of the reasons why, um, and uh, you know, multiplying by unitary matrices or taking the conjugate transpose uh, operations are fundamental operations that arise in many, many signal processing and engineering applications. And that's why for many of these applications, we are interested in working with the spectral norm because it's invariant to these two operations. It's a very special norm in that way. Okay, so um, it's, uh, it's, we still have about 12 minutes in the class, um, but uh, the next thing I want to talk about is um, about uh, some uses of these norms. Uh, we've discussed several theorems, but uh, now we can uh, maybe talk about um, um, uh, so, uh, solving linear systems and how these norms help us, for example, in bounding the error in computing inverses or solving uh, linear systems. Um, uh, now, if I start on the next thing I need about uh, let me see. Okay, so let's uh, let's just maybe make a few remarks and see how far we can go. Inverses and solutions to linear systems. Okay, so basically if we are given a matrix A, which is non-singular, we know that A inverse exists. But when we want to try to compute A inverse, then um, we may have to compute it on a finite precision arithmetic machine or maybe we don't get to observe A. Um, we only get to observe a noisy version of A. And uh, then we compute the inverse on a noisy version of A. It turns out that uh, under appropriate uh, modeling, you can actually generally consider both of these as a system where, uh, or a general uh, simple mathematical model under which you can consider both these types of errors is to consider that what you've inverted is some other matrix A plus E. So, given A in C to the N cross N, non-singular. So, pay attention to this. This is important. I'm starting out by assuming that the original matrix I wish to invert is actually non-singular. And that's why I'm brave enough to try to compute its inverse. And we wish to compute A inverse. So instead, we compute A plus E inverse, where E is an error matrix. So basically here E is small, such that A plus E is also invertible. So the error in the error I've incurred will be the this is like an error matrix which is A inverse minus A plus E inverse 
which I can write as I'll pull out an A inverse out of this. So I'll write it as A inverse minus I plus A inverse E inverse times A inverse. Okay, I'm just using the fact that A B inverse is B inverse A inverse to write this. Sure. Now, yeah, go ahead. Uh, so here we are trying to compute the inverse of a non-singular matrix. So this hmm. matrix E, is it deliberately added or uh, is it, you know, observed? I mean, so is, is it deliberately not, uh, added to make it invertible? No, no, no. A, A is non-singular to begin with. Okay. Okay. So I can freely write quantities like A inverse. Otherwise, this would be a meaningless thing to write uh, if A could be singular. So A is invertible. A plus E is also invertible. Okay, it's just okay. that I couldn't compute or I didn't have A exactly in my hands. What I got to observe was A plus E, where E was a small perturbation on A. Okay, okay. Such that A plus E was also invertible. So uh, I, I, I wanted A inverse, but I have A plus E inverse in my hand. The difference between these two is the error. Yes. Now, what we've seen is that if the spectral radius of A inverse E is less than one, then we can write I plus A inverse E inverse is equal to, we can write this as a series, sigma k equal to zero to infinity minus 1 power k a inverse e power k. So this is what we've, we just recently we saw this this result. Okay, so um, so we we can write it like this. So now I'll substitute this in here, which means that a inverse minus i plus a inverse e inverse times a inverse is equal to a inverse minus sigma k equal to 0 to infinity minus 1 power k a inverse e power k times a inverse. Now if I take the k equal to 0 term, I will get minus 1 power 0. This thing power 0 is the identity matrix times a inverse. So the first term here exactly cancels this a inverse. And so I will be left with this is equal to all the other terms k equal to 1 to infinity and I'll absorb this minus 1 into this and write it as minus 1 power k plus 1 times a inverse e power k times a inverse. Okay, so this is true if, so keep in mind my starting point is if rho of a inverse e is less than 1. Now suppose This is a matrix norm. And A inverse E measured according to this row of A inverse E is also less than one. And if I compute the norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse, so that will be equal to the norm of the summation k equal to 1 to infinity minus 1 power k plus 1 a inverse e power k a inverse which is less than or equal to I'll take the norm inside and I'll apply the submultiplicativity sigma k equal to 1 to infinity norm of a inverse e power k times norm of a inverse. Now this is not dependent on k, so it can come out of the summation. And norm of a inverse e is less than 1, so this is summable. And so I can write this to be equal to norm of a inverse e divided by 1 minus norm of a inverse e 
times norm of A inverse. So we now know, thus we know that the relative error if I define it to be norm of A inverse minus A plus E inverse divided by the norm of the guy I wanted to compute. So this is the relative error in computing A inverse. This can be upper bounded by norm of A inverse E divided by 1 minus norm of A inverse E. If norm of A inverse E is less than 1. That was the assumption we made. So we see that you know norms are useful to help us bound the relative error in computing things like A inverse. There are many more uses which we will see in the next class um, also with respect to of linear equations. But we'll stop here for today um, and uh, we'll continue on Monday. Thank you.